Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Bill Gleason. I'm the acting director of the Program in American Studies, which is co-sponsoring today's event with the Princeton Environmental Institute. I want to begin by thanking all the staff from both uh, groups who have worked to put on today's event, and also to PEI in particular for arranging the use of this space, GEO 10. I want to extend, uh, extend special thanks to Lars Hedin, the acting director of the program, uh, of the Princeton Environmental Institute for his ongoing effort to increase the visibility of the environmental humanities here at Princeton, to which this event is a contribution, and also for encouraging this particular collaboration with American Studies. Uh, we have two participants to introduce today. Our main speaker and first speaker will be McKay Jenkins, the Cornelius Tillman Professor of English and Director of Journalism at the University of Delaware. Professor Jenkins, who completed his PhD in English at Princeton in 1996, has been writing about people and the natural world for 25 years. His books include Bloody Falls of the Copper Mine, Madness and Murder in the Arctic Barren Lands, The Last Ridge, the epic story of the U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division and the assault on Hitler's Europe. The White Death, Tragedy and Heroism in an Avalanche Zone. Uh, he's the editor of the Peter Matheson Reader. And his first book was called The South in Black and White, Race, Sex and Literature in the 1940s. Jenkins is a former staff writer for the Atlanta Constitution and has written for many journals and periodicals including Outside, Orion and the New Republic. His current best-selling book, What's Gotten Into Us, Staying Healthy in a Toxic World, chronicles his investigation into the myriad synthetic chemicals we encounter in our daily lives and the growing body of evidence about the harm these chemicals do to our bodies and the environment. Um, this fascinating and frightening topic will be the focus of Professor Jenkins' talk today. Our second guest, and I'll introduce him now, but he'll come up after uh, McKay's presentation, is acclaimed author Richard Preston. Also a PhD graduate of the Department of English at Princeton, Preston has written eight books, including The Hot Zone, The Cobra Event, and The Demon in the Freezer, which are known as his Dark Biology Trilogy. His books have been translated into more than 30 languages, and he has won numerous awards, including the American Institute of Physics Award, and the National Magazine Award. Probably that combination is unusual. He's also the only person who is not a medical doctor to have received the Center for Disease Control's Champion of Prevention Award for Public Health. Uh, according to his website, he also has a dangerously large asteroid named after him. On November 22nd, HarperCollins will release Micro, a high-concept thriller in the vein of Jurassic Park, which is Preston's completion of Michael Crichton's last unfinished novel, left unfinished at the time of his death in 2008. So in a couple of weeks, we'll have an opportunity to get that as well. Um, all right, so after Professor Jenkins' talk, we'll turn things over to Preston, who will um, offer a few remarks of his own, and then join Professor Jenkins in conversation about the topic about writing, about, uh, about any number of things before turning it open to broader conversation. So uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming McKay Jenkins and Richard Preston. Well, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, what Professor Gleason failed to mention is that he and I uh, played soccer on the same JV soccer team at Amherst College 27 years ago, I think, and uh, we owed all our defensive strength to his, uh, his fullback playing. Uh, so it's great for me to be back here. I, I graduated uh, with a PhD in 96, and I have to say, I mean, I've been on a college campus ever since, but I still get very uh, sentimental somehow about coming back here. It's a place that uh, is very, very dear to my heart, I have to say more than any other place I've been as a student or as a professor. So thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. So uh, as Professor Gleason said, I'm going to talk about this book and show you some images. There are no images in the book. There's just a lot of narrative in the book. But I've got some images to go along with it just to illustrate some of the things that I'll be talking about. 
Uh, and this story is the first time uh, as a book writer that I've ever used the first person. And uh, this is something maybe we'll talk about later on. But the book starts with uh, a story of a personal experience that I had, uh, which I'll tell you briefly now. Um, about six years ago, I went to see my physician with what I thought was a running or a cycling injury. I was having some pain in my left hip. And uh, he said it's probably just a routine overuse athletic injury of some sort. And what you should do is go see an orthopedist, have it checked out, and I'm sure everything will be fine. So I did that. Uh, and the orthopedist said I should get an MRI, which I did. Again, totally routine, no, no problem. Uh, and I went in the clanging cylinder. Some of you may have had that pleasant experience. It's, it's something you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. But I uh, thought nothing of it, came home, and uh, a few days later, at 4.59 on a Friday afternoon, which is when these phone calls always seem to come, the phone rang, and it was my orthopedist saying, you have a suspicious mass in your abdomen and you need to call an oncologist right away. Uh, and then he hung up and presumably went off to play golf. Uh, I was left, of course, with that, that all too familiar feeling of uh, despair, I suppose, or fear, uh, some combination of that. And my wife and I at the time had, uh, we still have two children, but at the time our children were four and a year and a half old. And uh, I remember distinctly going outside of our house and looking back in the window after getting this phone call and thinking, seeing my two children playing on the floor and thinking about what life might be like for them with one parent. Uh, so for about a month, my wife and I made the usual panicked phone calls to physicians and friends of ours who knew doctors and tried to figure out what this could be, uh, what to do about it. Uh, and we ended up on the schedule, thankfully, uh, of a surgeon in New York City. And I went up there and got all duded up in my surgical gown and uh, was sitting in the waiting room with headphones on, uh, piping the Dalai Lama straight into my mainframe, trying to kind of prepare myself for this moment. And um, just about two hours, I suppose, before I was to go into the operating suite, some researchers came up to me with their clipboard and said, do you mind if we ask you some questions? And I said, I'm listening to the Dalai Lama right now. Don't you, don't you understand? And I said, sure, fine, go ahead. And they started asking me questions about uh, what they called my chemical exposures. Now, at the time, I mean, I, I've been interested in environmental things for many years, and I won't say that this was the first time I ever really thought about this, but this was the first time I ever thought about it in the context of what I was going through. And these questions went on and on and on. This was, this was not 10 questions. This was hundreds of questions about uh, chemical exposures, and it was not industrial exposure. It was the exposure to chemicals that you find once you start thinking about it in products that we all use every single day. So they asked these questions. I answered them as best I could, and they left. I went into, the sur into surgery and woke up about three hours later with my surgeon and my wife uh, smiling at me at the foot of my bed, and I figured something had gone right. Uh, and the surgeon said, we can't know for sure because we haven't done the full tissue sample, but it appears that this tumor, which, by the way, was the size of a baseball, uh, was benign, lo and behold. I said, benign? I said, what are the chances of that? He said, we see about 100 of these tumors a year, and four are benign. So you drew the long straw this time. And I thought, good, that's nice to know. Uh, but what about all those questions that they'd been asking me? I thought, you know, I, uh, I mean, I was overjoyed to be in the position I was in, but I was left as anyone, anyone who's a writer, anyone who's a journalist, uh, is irritated by questions that they haven't figured out answers to. So I kind of came home and started spending some time looking into this topic. And that's what gave birth to this book. Uh, the book starts with that story, with a prologue about my own experience and the, this battery of questions that I was asked. And then it moves into a series of chapters trying to ask questions about uh, what they were up to, what were they asking about, what, what are these chemicals, where are they, where are they made, what are they made into, uh, under what circumstances, how do they get into our bodies, how do they get into our environment. So the book progresses from chapter to chapter this way. It goes from my little prologue to a chapter called The Body, uh, in which I go to Maine and I interview a bunch of people who have been uh, volu have volunteered for what they call a body burden study, where they can take samples of your hair, your blood, and your urine and spin them through a laboratory and tell what chemicals you have in your body at this particular moment. Now, 
they can't yet, the scientific community cannot yet say, because you have flame retardants in your breast tissue, we can guarantee you that you will get breast cancer. But they can say that we can find these, these chemicals in your body and we can in a laboratory show that these chemicals tend to lead towards things like breast cancer or other chemicals tend to lead towards developmental problems or early onset puberty or neurological problems, all kinds of different things. So in other words, we can find them in your body and we in a laboratory can, we can prove these are detrimental to your health. We have not yet been able to trace a particular chemical to a particular disease. We know this from watching the tobacco industry uh, worm its way out of legal cases for decades saying, you can't prove to me that your lung cancer came from cigarettes. The industry, we'll talk about this in a minute, but the chemical industry learned everything it knows about that particular argument from the tobacco industry. Uh, the book then goes to a chapter called The Home, where I invite a Johns Hopkins trained uh, toxicologist to walk through my house room by room and do a kind of home inspection, but not for things like my electrical system, but just to simply look at everything that's in the house and point to various things and ask questions about, do you know the provenance of these products or the provenance of these ingredients of these products? Uh, then there's a chapter called The Big Box Store, where my wife and I go to a, uh, a giant a retailer whose name I won't reveal, but it begins with a W. Uh, and we walk aisle by aisle and just simply look at labels and look at what's not labeled. And you will find, for example, products in the automotive section that'll have a label on it that'll say, warning, this product contains ingredients known to cause cancer in the state of California. And I figured, well, that's, we're safe because we're in Maryland. <laughs> uh, but then you go to the cosmetics aisle, and you find there are no labels on the products. Although, once you start doing some research, you know that they contain the same ingredients, same carcinogenic ingredients, but they're not required to put a label on them. And it raises the question, why would you force a product that's going on your engine block to have a label and not force a product that's going to go on your face to have a label? Uh, then there are two, the two final chapters. One is called The Tap, and Richard is going to talk about this in a, in a minute. Uh, the question is, what, where does our drinking water come from, and what gets into it, and what problems can we anticipate? And then the last chapter is called The Lawn, which is about all kinds of lawn and agricultural chemicals. And I, I happen to live in Baltimore and am very interested, both professionally in my writing and in my teaching with the Chesapeake Bay, with, with watershed uh, protection generally. Um, I teach, I mean, in fact, I'm just starting at the University of Delaware where I teach an environmental humanities program, and we're going to be using things like the Chesapeake Bay as a, you know, these laboratories to do not just scientific research, but all the humanities research that goes into this sort of thing. Um, so, well, I'll show you some images in a minute about the Chesapeake Bay. So that's the way the book is structured, and maybe later we can talk about uh, how this, this came to be. But let's just start with some images. And I, I promise I won't do this for very long, but maybe you know, 15 minutes worth of images and we'll give us something to think about. So this is the book. Uh, and the story historically starts in 1912 when a famous boat sank. Uh, you may think you know why this, book, this uh, boat is so famous, but this is the real reason it was famous. When, this, when the Titanic was raised, the uh, marine archaeologists were, were very interested and surprised to find that there were no synthetic, or products made from some synthetic materials on the boat in 1912. And if you think about it, um, if you think about what, what that means, uh, you know, the petrochemical industry as we have come to know it essentially got started in World War II. So 30 years after a world in which the most luxurious ocean liner on Earth has no synthetics on it, we suddenly get to uh, the, the century that we have come to know. So we, we start to find oil and start to find ways to use oil. Uh, I apologize in advance for some of the attitude in this presentation, but uh, you've you got to believe me, I am, I've lived with this long enough to earn it. Uh, so we know petrochemicals tend to spill, uh, that's, we, we hear about that. But what we may not understand, at least general readers don't understand, that petrochemicals don't just make your car go. 
Petrochemicals are also the building blocks for virtually everything. I mean, coming to Princeton, it's funny, this is the only place I can't actually do this because you're actually sitting in wood chairs, which is really rare. You gotta take it from me, right? Everywhere else I talk, everybody's sitting in these, you know, vinyl foam things. Uh, but here there's actual wood in this room. It's really nice to see. Uh, but anyway, if you go to a, a giant big box store whose name begins with W and you walk down every aisle, you will find every single thing in that store is made one way or another with something made out of petrochemicals. So if you ever stop to think about what kind of volume we're talking about, uh, the volume that goes into fuel, but also into everything else, here's a statistic. Uh, we make or import 27 trillion pounds of chemicals. That's roughly enough to fill 600,000 tanker trucks, each carrying 8,000 gallons from San Francisco to DC. In fact, that sentence begins with the words every day. We're talking about a lot of stuff. Chemical industry is a $637 billion industry, roughly. They produce 70,000 products, or materials for 70,000 products. And again, this is what a big box store looks like, as you know. And if you just think about it, and you walk by, it's not just the paint section, but go down by the, the children's pajama section, for example, and ask what this stuff is made out of. Uh, most of the time, you won't find any labels on them. Now, the, the premise of this book, of course, uh, it goes beyond science, it gets into a lot of politics and culture, and you might start asking yourself, well, how is it, how is the regulatory uh, environment come to be the way it is? How is it that these products are not required to label anything or tell you the provenance of uh, what the ingredients are? So we've known, this is an old photograph, if you think about the way our food is now wrapped in plastic. Our bodies, we know, this is a photo from uh, the 1950s when DuPont released its first nylon stockings, and uh, you can see women, I mean, the, if you look at the news photographs from the time that what women did to get their hands on nylon stockings was, as I tell my undergrads, kind of like going to a Justin Bieber, Bieber concert. You know, it was the, the, a frenzy to wrap their legs in synthetics. Our houses, you see, probably seen this image, this idea of covering everything we can with paint. Uh, our faces, we know this, the cosmetics industry is, is a very large, $60 billion dollars. Uh, virtually unregulated. There are 400 chemicals, just for example, in American cosmetics that are illegal to use in Europe. Uh, one thing we'll talk about later is the way Europe regulates uh, synthetics differently than the United States do. It's actually radically different. Um, uh, I have a particular pet peeve about lawn chemicals uh, grown largely because of, of this newfound interest in, in watersheds. Uh, but if you think about the history of the lawn, it's actually, a, 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 this was my favorite chapter to write. The history of the American lawn is a very interesting one and reflects a great deal about American culture. If you think about the 1950s uh, suburban ideal of Levittown and everybody's got their perfect posted stamp. If you look at that image, not necessarily just culture, but look at it ecologically or think about what's going on in the grass, everybody wants, mon I mean, the, the grass is monoculture, it's all imported. There's no native plant there anywhere in sight, and all the flowers presumably are also imported from somewhere else. And you give rise to this sort of suburban aesthetic of wanting either monoculture grass or imported plants, because the more exotic your plants, the more distinguished you become from your neighbors, and how the outside of your house becomes a reflection of what uh, is on the inside of the house. And then you do things like read the Levittown newspapers that were circulating in the neighborhoods, and it'll say things in the editorial page like, uh, uh, you know, it is, it is required that you spray and mow your lawn every week because you know a shaggy lawn uh, tends to reflect a shaggy homeowner, and you know the implication was that if people who don't mow their lawn are, are closet communists, you know there's a whole kind of Cold War aesthetic going on about the aesthetics of of people's lawn, which give rise to all kinds of issues. So this is what things looked like in the 40s and 50s. Uh, of course, it then leads to this kind of thing, where and, and fans of Rachel Carson know the story all too well that you start getting a kind of a chemical dependency where you're. Uh, you know, you've got this newfound fantasy that you can spray your way to a purified or uh, sanitized landscape, and we know the results of this. You talk to anybody who is, you know, 50 years old or older, and they will tell you stories about playing stickball when the DDT trucks went through town and fogged the whole neighborhood with, uh, you know, very famous ecological results. So today, we don't just have Levittowns, now we have the McMansions with, the, you know, acre or five acres of mowed and sprayed lawn, and you know, if you're a, uh, a co I'll, I'll tell you later about a colleague of mine named Doug Ptolemy, who's an entomologist who's written a book about uh, trying to convince suburban homeowners to plant native species on their property. If you look at this piece of ground, not as a human being, but as a bird, uh, you'd be in pretty sad shape because there's not a whole lot for you to eat. And as he says, 
Uh, he's a guy who spends a lot of time in Costa Rica talking about or researching the, the songbirds that migrate from there. Through here, he says, you know, if you wake up in the morning and you hear out your window a bird that is uh, singing, you know, a lovely tune on the tree outside your bedroom, chances are that bird has just completed a 300-mile flight and is now looking to eat and is in the verge of starving. And he's looking down and he sees that. Uh, he's out of luck. And it won't be long before you don't see any more birds on your property. And, you know, if there's enough of this, you're not going to see birds anywhere. And you start looking at some population crashes around the eastern seaboard, and you get some uh, sort of startling numbers. Now, the suburban lawn, lawn thing now looks like this. We've got guys like this, or we've got armies of trucks like this. Uh, every suburban homeowner knows this scene in the spring, uh, stretching straight through the season, uh, everybody trying to outdo each other with their lawn chemicals. So the upshot is that since this, the Titanic went down with no petrochemicals aboard, these products and, of, made out of synthetics are pretty well everywhere we look. You see an image like this and you think, well, that's good, they're recycling, that's a good sign. So that would be, you know, you'd interpret that as a positive image. But what you don't see, of course, is that a very small fraction of plastic ever gets recycled. The rest of it sort of spreads around. And, you know, you read stories about the Pacific garbage patch or the Pacific gyre, whatever you call it, about the, you know, the fact of uh, small particles of plastic now outnumbering plankton in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, that sort of thing. They become you know, headline-grabbing news events. Um, the trouble is, is, it's not just in the form of these, of, of, you know, garbage rolling up on a shore. What, what we're looking at now is the fact that scientists can find these synthetic chemicals in the very strangest places. So you can find evidence of synthetic man-made chemicals on the top of Aconcagua, the highest mountain in South America. You can find them in the bodies of Inuit people in the Arctic. You can find them in beluga whales who are coming down with breast cancer in the St. Lawrence uh, waterway. And you ask yourself, well, how is that possible? This is not uh, Newark, New Jersey. This is not Wilmington, Delaware. How is it these chemicals are saturating these bodies in these places? Uh, we're familiar with these images of uh, you know, oil-soaked people and oil-soaked birds after oil spills. Uh, Prepare yourself for a very unfair image. Uh, this is what I'm interested in, is how this stuff gets into our bodies. How is it that synthetic chemicals are getting into us? Now, uh, for the last 10 years or so, the CDC and uh, a variety of state organizations have started doing these body burden studies, where they're now testing people's uh, fluids and tissue to see the prevalence of these chemicals as they're saturating our environment, saturating our bodies. And in virtually every one of these studies, these groups can find as, almost as many chemicals as they test for. So you test for 50, you find 40. You test for 70, you find 60. The, the, the upshot is that you find these synthetics in, in every study that they run. And you start asking questions, how many chemicals are in use today? Most people estimate about 80,000 synthetic chemicals are in use. How many have been adequately tested for their impacts on health? About 200, which is almost ungraphably small. So the question is, where does it all come from and where does it all go? I mentioned this before. So you can find chemicals in the hardware section uh, that are labeled as carcinogens, only in California, of course. Uh, they're not labeled in the cosmetics aisle. Same stuff. Uh, one in 10 American families uses commercial lawn care service. One in five applies pesticides itself. Uh, only 10% of pesticides have ever been adequately tested. In Denver, this is just, I mean, you can imagine there are a number of studies done like this, but in Denver, studies show that kids whose yards were treated with pesticides are four times more likely to develop soft tissue tumors than kids whose yards were not treated. Uh, in, this, in the chapter in the lawn section, I, I spent a lot of time with a guy up in Maine who has started a, a, an organization called safelawns.org. He's kind of trying to uh, start an alternative uh, lawn care service that uses only organic uh, treatments, and he says that it's shocking to him that people are allowed to buy pesticides and herbicides in a hardware store without a license. He says people should not be allowed to uh, purchase this stuff uh, unless they're professionals. Now, thinking not in terms of health, but in terms of ecology, if you think about uh, the amount of lawn we're talking about nationwide, it's actually somewhere closer to 50 million acres of lawn, of manicured lawn, uh, which is roughly the size of Nebraska. And if you think about what that means in terms of how many pesticides it takes to spray all that, it's quite a big number. Now, uh, I don't know if you're as aware of this up here as we are down in Maryland, but uh, this is what's known as a dead zone. 
uh, where you have the fertilizer runoff from suburban lawns and from agricultural farms, and, and especially in our case on the Eastern Shore, chicken farms, these industrial chicken farms on the Eastern Shore, which uh, PBS did a frontline piece about uh, the Chesapeake, where they, they used a statistic which I then borrowed, uh, where they say that the amount of chicken waste that is dumped into the Chesapeake is the equivalent of four major American cities. I think it was Atlanta, Philadelphia, Chicago, and New York. Uh, that an equivalent amount of sewage is draining into the, uh, the Chesapeake every year untreated. It's the equivalent of four major American cities. And the chicken lobby on the Eastern Shore is one of the most political, uh, politically powerful forces in the state. And from uh, administration to administration, they have a stranglehold on any kind of regulation of chicken farming over there. And uh, anyway, this is what we're talking about. Uh, and of course, there's the whole pharmaceutical drug thing. I mean, I know that's a, that's a really uh, central industry here in central New Jersey, pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, the Associated Press, a few about, I guess, 18 months ago or so, did a story about... Uh, testing municipal water supplies in every major American city, and they found pharmaceutical drugs uh, that you could test for in, in every glass of tap water, no matter what city you were talking about. So you can find Viagra coming out of the tap in Los Angeles, which I always think makes kind of a sense. Uh, you can test the water in Philadelphia and find antipsychotic medications, which I figure they got to like up the dosage there or something. I don't know. But there's the, uh, the idea here is that the you know, we all take way too many drugs, uh, legal and illegal, and they are imperfectly metabolized. And as somebody said, Americans have the most expensive urine in the world. I mean, the amount of stuff that passes through us into the water supply is, again, quantifiable. Uh, then, of course, you've got the other weird thing, and, and the role of China in this whole story is actually quite prominent because China manufactures everything we use. It's even less regulated there than it is here. And, you know, every now and then you'll hear a story about China manufacturing nutritional supplements or something that's got, you know, antifreeze in it, uh, which is a whole other can of worms. A couple of years ago, you probably read about this. this is, these are the, the top story, the big headline kinds of things, where they had to recall 20 million pieces of toys that were imported from China that were painted with lead paint. We thought lead was something we'd gotten rid of 50 years ago. You read a lot about things like bisphenol A and baby bottles, uh, an endocrine disruptor. Flame retardants, right? This is the big story here was uh, a study that came out of Sweden where they, they, again, they found out that these flame retardants were showing up in everybody's bodies. They knew that they were bad for people, so they banned them. And, you know, Sweden being Sweden, they can do things like that. They just banned them. And in three years, the amount of these flame retardants showing up in women's breast tissue dropped by 30%, just in three years. In the United States, uh, you know, regulation is purely voluntary. Shows up in children's pajamas, uh, or uh, all kinds of electronic stuff. Anything that gets hot. Phthalates, you read about this all the time. This is the water that's in plastic drinking water bottles. Anything that's got soft plastic, you know, this is, this is made with phthalates. And, you know, I don't know if you saw this story, but just last week the EPA officially allowed bottle, uh, water bottling companies to allow a certain amount of phthalates to be, uh, you know, quantifiable in their in their bottles of water. So now you're, you're locking in a, in a, a certain amount of hormone-disrupting chemicals into your plastic water. Now, um, of course, phthalates are in lots of other products, like things like uh, baby toys, soft, soft baby toys. And what these companies will say disingenuously is, you know, we didn't make these things to go in a kid's mouth. It makes you wonder if these industry spokesmen ever had children. Uh, you can find phthalates in all kinds of other things, like air, so-called air fresheners, yeah, in, in quotation marks. Uh, now, here's the question. Now, I know that you guys, are, as an audience, are probably less uh, pondered, uh, ponderous about this kind of thing as, as some of my others. But you know, people get very overwhelmed, like, just like they do when they start reading about climate change. They get so overwhelmed by the possible future implications of this, they want to know what to do. Uh, and the question is, should you think and act like a, a consumer or should you think and act like a political actor? And the answer, of course, is try to do both. I won't drag you through this, but the EU has passed very uh, important legislation about five years ago where they now are forcing industries to regulate chemicals before they go on the market. Uh, they are forcing them to regulate chemicals that they produce in much smaller quantities than the US. Uh, they are forcing them to uh, test them for all kinds of health implications. Canada is doing the same kind of thing. Um, 
getting lists of dangerous chemicals, regulating them, forcing industry to be much more proactive in making sure this stuff is safe before they release it uh, onto the market. In the US, it's not true. Uh, in the US, I mean, the general rule of, of thumb here is that in Europe, chemicals are guilty until proven innocent, and in the United States, they're, in, they're uh, innocent until proven guilty. How do you get a chemical banned? In the history of, of the federal legislation on this, uh, out of the 80,000 chemicals we see in USA, only five chemicals have ever been banned. Five. Just the last line, when the EPA did its own study, it found only 7% of high production volume chemicals had ever had a full set of uh, health data. 7% is a small number. Now, you all live, many of you uh, obviously are living here in New Jersey. You know probably that Frank Lautenberg has, has pushed through some, or has introduced legislation trying to update what's known as TOSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act, which has not been updated since Gerald Ford was president 40 years ago. Uh, and this would ask industry to start uh, paying more attention to the health implications of its ingredients and also label things, like provide more information to consumers. It also would require the EPA to start, start, start spending more time identifying these chemicals and cleaning up some of these so-called hot spots. These are places that might uh, you know, logically lead to things like cancer clusters. Uh, start paying more attention to community health. Uh, in, the ab sorry, in the absence of any kind of legislation from the federal government, which is, is essentially, again, neutered by industry, states around the country are starting to work on this. Uh, Maryland, Maine, uh, California, Washington State, Oregon, they're passing, as many states are with climate change uh, chemicals, they're trying to regulate it at the state level because the feds have just been totally uh, neutered, like I say, by industry. Um, Consumers, my recommendation is that you go old school. Uh, you know, have wooden seats in your classrooms. Your grandmother didn't need synthetic chemicals, and neither do you. I, I kind of steal this idea from Michael Pollan, right? Apples are better than Twinkies. Just as you should eat real food with ingredients you can recognize, so you should consider only buying things made from materials you can pronounce. I think that would be a good rule of thumb. That chair is made of wood. Okay, I'll buy it. That chair is made out of plastic. I don't know what that means. I won't buy it. Uh, I'll just run through this. this the book has a, a very user-friendly kind of uh, uh, handy-dandy guide at the end. But you know, you want to buy, if you're going to put your kids to bed, let them be wearing cotton, not, not flame retardants. Uh, you know, laundry detergents out of, made out of plants. It's actually possible. People knew this for a long time, that you could clean stuff with plant-based ingredients. You didn't need petrochemicals. Uh, mattresses, you can buy them made out of wool or natural latex rather than synthetics. Uh, you know, there's this new fangled stuff called olive oil. It's actually just as effective as Teflon, uh, you know, and doesn't cause uh, all kinds of problems. Uh, wood, can you be shocked? I mean, I don't know, maybe you know this, but plywood is glued together with formaldehyde. Uh, when you read about Hurricane Katrina, when they took uh, Survivors of Katrina, FEMA went down there and put all these people in these, these FEMA trailers and then had to kick them out of the trailers because the FEMA trailers had been built with all this low-grade low plywood which had such high levels of formaldehyde that these people were getting sick. Uh, but the truth is, I don't know about this room, but you know, most people's houses are sheathed in plywood that's, that's glued together with formaldehyde. Clean your kitchen, your bathroom, your laundry, your teeth, your hair, anything else that needs to be cleaned with products made from plant materials rather than chlorine and other toxic synthetics. You know, a lot of the stuff is very, very basic, very commonsensical. <coughs> Tap water, despite what you're about to hear from Richard, is actually better than bottled water because at least you're not getting the plastics from the bottle in the water. It's a small consolation, I realize. Uh, you know, you can buy rugs made out of wool or better than wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, which are made with all kinds of things, stain resistors and flame retardants. Um, toys made out of wood, not a bad idea as long as they're not painted with lead. The book has, a, has a lots of websites, you know, <laughs> if you're looking for, for things like this. Uh, synthetic air fresheners, it's just a joke. It's, it's really like a, one of the great oxymorons. Um, and I, I will now tell you a line that I got from my wife. If you want your house to smell like an apple pie, uh, bake an apple pie. You know, uh, yeah. Cosmetics, I, I will tell you, maybe we can talk about this later, but, but it turns out that women 
politically uh, have been driving this conversation because especially the cosmetics thing has driven women around the bend. When they find out things like uh, cosmetics and, and toys and things made for their children are you know, funneling uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals not just into their body but then through their breast milk or through their you know, in utero to their children they tend to get very uh, aggravated and so when you look at some of these <coughs> state movements to regulate chemicals it's often being driven by women who uh, just don't seem to be able to stand this idea. And cosmetics is often the, the central rallying cry for them. There's a great website called Safe Cosmetics. Uh, your basement, all kinds, I don't know, for me, when I had the toxicologist walk through my house, my basement was the, the red zone. I had just cans and cans of things just out there off-gassing like crazy right beneath my kitchen. And uh, I had never really paid attention to it. Uh, your lawn, you know, this, this again, I, I won't repeat myself, but uh, getting, getting hip to your lawn is, would be a good idea. If your lawn care company insists on using pesticides, then fire them is my recommendation. And uh, think about either not using pesticides or at least using organic ones. And just one quick aside, this is my favorite example from the lawn story is that uh, uh, lawn care companies figured out a long time ago that they could make a lot of money by convincing you that clover was an evil weed, right? And they could sell you a broadleaf uh, herbicide that would kill all the clover and not kill your grass, right? So they had to convince you. Now, clover had been in people's lawns for a long time with no problem. But if they could convince you that clover was a weed, they could then sell you stuff to kill it, which they did. But then they found out, people found out that clover is a nitrogen fixer. And once you get rid of all the clover, suddenly your soil under your grass is no longer getting any nitrogen. So then these companies would come around and sell you synthetic fertilizers. So now rather than selling you zero products, they can sell you two, right? Getting used to clover would save you a lot of money. I mean, a lot, this, this story here is not about spending a lot more money to live green. It might be about spending no money. So that's just, that's just something to think about. Clover is your, you know, it doesn't have to be an enemy. And better yet, and this is again where I learned this from my colleague Doug Talmy, this notion of, of uh, creating vast, or even, I mean, I live on one eighth of an acre in Baltimore, and I have now converted something like, I don't know, 30% of my lawn to native plants. And in the space of just a year or two, I now have, I'm the only house in my block that has got butterflies and goldfinches and everything kind of, and all the kids are running around in my house to look at the butterflies. And I thought, wouldn't that be an interesting aesthetic change if suddenly that was hip, not having the perfectly manicured lawn? So, you know, think about this idea of, of uh, native species. And, and Doug Talmy, whose book I'm gonna tell you about right here, Doug Talmy's book, Bringing Nature Home, if anybody's looking for a, a very handy dandy guide to doing this, it's a terrific book. And he talks about if you just had a small percentage of all suburban homes doing this, you could create like a, the country's greatest national uh, wildlife refuge. Just on, you know, if you think about parcel by parcel by parcel and think about the benefit that would have ecologically. So that's it. Uh, I have a website, if anybody's interested, where I kind of keep it updated with news studies on these political developments, marketing uh, or uh, market-based uh, movements to try to get companies. A couple of weeks ago, or a couple of months ago, Walmart decided they would no longer sell any products made with flame retardants. And you know, Walmart doesn't do anything out of the goodness of its heart. It responds to market pressure like anybody else. So these things do, in fact, have some traction. But the question of whether it's more effective to act politically or as a consumer is really a, a difficult one, and I think it's important to keep them both in mind. So that's, that's what I have for you, uh, and we, I'll be happy to take a couple questions in a minute, but I think Richard's going to come up and show a couple images himself. So thanks for your attention. So you see where your thing is up here? Oh, great. Thank you, McKay. That was great. That was really interesting. Um, I hope in just a moment we can sit there and carry on a dialogue. Um, and I'd love to invite everybody here to participate in our conversation. Um, I, just, I, I was just thinking about what I might want to say today, and I did a little thought experiment. Uh, let me see if I can show you the results. I, I, it was a, a sort of a thought experiment with Google Earth.
I presume most of us here um, live in the Princeton area and probably drink the water. Um, so um, those of you who are in the environmental sciences program, you may know a lot more about this than I do, so I want to apologize in advance <coughs> if I've got my facts entirely wrong. And if I do, please correct me. Um, but uh, what we have on Google Earth is we have an aerial view of Trenton. Uh, you can see uh, uh, Route 1 goes right through the middle of the image vertically. Uh, down in the kind of lower right center, you see the Trenton train station, if you've ever been there uh, to pick somebody up. Um, on the left, the government buildings. And then uh, there are a series of, there's a series of brownfield sites, um, some of which were Superfund sites, or are. Um, along the kind of the north side of that US-1 corridor. Now we can uh, zoom in a little bit. Uh, now again, we're looking at US-1, and there's a brownfield site, um, kind of just to the north of where US-1 bends there as it's coming down into Trenton. You also see a, a solar array there. Uh, that's where, um, that was originally, I think, a Superfund site that's now generating power. We zoom in a little bit more, and now we're looking at the brownfield site. This place has obviously not been cleaned up. I don't know what it was. Um, but we're now going to look at where um, a large portion of Princeton's water supply comes from. The Delaware and Raritan Canal passes right next to that brownfield site. You can see US-1 here. And what you're looking at is the DNR Canal, just before it goes underground, and there's a grating right there. That's the grating on the DNR Canal. And then you can see the debris and the slush that's piled up against that grating. Um, a Trenton cop told me that, yeah, there it is, right there. Trenton cop told me that once every few years, a human body um, will be found drifted up against the grating. And it's been in the water for usually weeks. Um, and I, yeah, the guy laughed and he said, yeah, that's what they're drinking when it, cuts, when it gets to Princeton. Um, so the little thought experiment is, here we are, there's Route 1, there's this brownfield site, and there's Princeton's water. Uh, um, uh, that's all I have to say, uh, except that it, it doesn't make me feel too good about uh, the water that I drink in Princeton. Um, it, it used to be a lot better. Anyway. Um, so, um, the first person to talk about, um, essentially, we enter into this story through you. And we enter it through your body. So I wanted to describe my experience of reading your book for the first time. You know, McKay and I have known each other for a long time. And, uh, but I had no idea that you had this cancer scare. So I opened this book up, and I'm reading chapter one. And it's, it's, a, it's a totally frightening experience to read about your, you know, your cancer scare, in which I thought I was actually reading an account uh, of you having cancer. And I was saying to myself, oh my God, you know, he's, you know, he's battling cancer, this is terrible, you know, how much worse is this gonna get? And then there's the, um, the wonderful relief. You didn't have it. And I'm, I wanna ask you um, how you came across that, that way of entering the narrative. Um, it's, it always seems to me that when, you, you know, when you're reading a book by an author, there's always, um, there's a kind of personal obsession somewhere in that book, or the author never would have written the book in the first place. So I'd like to ask about how you came about bringing yourself into that story. Well, uh, for those of you who have any experience working with editors, you may recognize this kind of story. When I uh, agreed to do this book, this book was actually suggested to me by my publisher. And they said, uh, we want to do a book about toxic chemicals that's accessible to uh, non uh, experts, non-specialists. And I said, I think I could do that. And they said, good, go do it. Uh, now, I don't know about you, maybe some of you know more about chemistry than I do, but the idea that you're going to write a 350-page narrative about polybrominated diphenyl ethers and have it appeal to someone who's looking through the stacks at Barnes & Noble is a fairly daunting proposition. Uh, it doesn't immediately suggest narrative uh, trajectories. It doesn't immediately suggest stories. And as a journalist, you're always trying to figure out a way to uh, deliver information in a way that it will actually keep people interested who don't necessarily know or uh, care about the, the 
specific topic that you're talking about. Uh, I think of it as kind of like the sugar that helps the medicine go down. Like, I mean, I, I'm going to try to tell you everything I know about polybrominate diphenyl ethers, but I've got to tell it in such a way that if you can't even read that word without getting a headache, you will still hang in there. So the idea, I mean, it, 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 I didn't go out and get a tumor to support the book, right? The tumor just sort of happened, and uh, it seemed like a logical way to do it, because what this topic initially lacked was any kind of personal uh, intimacy, any kind of... Um, Again, like a narrative proposition. And the proposition that, as, as luck would have it, that I had a mystery of my own that I wanted to go out and pursue was a useful thing to have, a useful hook to hang the story on. Now, I was telling Richard earlier that uh, it, it became quickly obvious to me that these body burden studies were a really useful tool to get into this story because uh, you know, I, I've talked to students about this all the time, and, and undergraduates, not that they're dissimilar from anybody else, they really don't want to know, they don't want to think about the fact that they are coming into contact with these chemicals all day, every single day. I mean, whether, whether you think about putting on 20 different personal care products onto your body every single day, from your shampoos to your cosmetics to whatever else, many of which are totally unregulated to your mattresses and your clothing and your laundry detergents and the whole gamut to say nothing of construction materials and your rugs and your Teflon and your food and blah, 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 blah. Like they, they can't get their head around that, nor do they want to. Because what you quickly find out, of course, is that we are all so surrounded by this stuff, there's really no avoiding it unless you start really spending some serious time researching things. So if they don't want to know about it, how do you convince them that they ought to be paying attention to this? And the body burden stories, uh, body burden studies narratively for me work the same way that they are working for some of these environmental groups, which is to say, uh, what we're talking about here is not an abstraction. What we're talking about is something that is in your body right now and we can test for it. And if you would be willing to submit uh, your, your tissue to it, we would prove it to you. And you have cancer causing chemicals in your body, not out there, but in here. That becomes a useful thing. And my, the debate I had uh, was whether to get myself tested for this, whether I should go ahead and, and test myself for 75 or 100 chemicals. Uh, now, the fact is that 100 chemicals is a tiny fraction of 80,000, so that becomes only a, a, a nominal thing to do anyway. But then the other reality is, is that my wife and I had just been through this trauma and decided, I would say she decided, and I, being a good husband, agreed uh, that learning that I had 17 or 75 carcinogenic chemicals in my body post-operation was not something I needed to find out, not something that we needed to find out. So I opted not to do that. I opted not to go for that narrative uh, possibility. And fortunately, uh, these body burden studies are going on in a variety of different places, and I could, already, I could go interview people who'd already had these tests done, and I could finesse that I could tell their story rather than tell my story. So the effort is always to try to find some narrative into these distinctly non-narrative stories, in this case, synthetic chemicals, and find some way to tell a story. And that's the decision I had to make. So, um, When you go about um, interviewing people, how do you do it? Well, I, uh, I think, like Richard, I came to Princeton with two objectives. I came first to work as close as I could with John McPhee, uh, and secondly, to get an academic job so I could go and try to be John McPhee. Uh, and I've been you know, spending much of my life doing my damnedest to try to figure out how he does what he does. And as you know, if, you, if you've read his books, what he likes to do more than anything uh, is get people into a canoe. Uh, and this happens, strangely, to be an, a, a passion of mine, too. So. Uh, I decided in the tap section, you know, again, how are you going to write about the fact that there are uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals in our drinking supply that are of a level high enough that, if you probably heard about this, in the Potomac River, uh, scientists are now finding what they call transsex fish. So you have male fish that are, uh, you know, have female sexual traits and vice versa. How is that, how does that happen? Now, how do you tell that story in a narrative way? Well, I decided to get in a canoe in this case not in the Potomac, but in the Brandywine River, which supplies the drinking water for North Delaware, get in, the, get in the, uh, a canoe with the head of uh, Delaware's drinking water uh, regulatory agency and canoe the Brandywine with him and have him talk about all the various things that might be contaminating the water in the river. And then we go into kind of like uh, Virgil going into uh, 
the water treatment plant descending down, down, down into the places where they're actually turning river water into tap water. And I'm looking at water that the next place it goes will be into somebody's glass. It's been treated with chlorine, it's been treated with all these various things, fluoride, all of which, by the way, in case you haven't seen them, come in big bags marked with giant skull and crossbones, including fluoride and chlorine in addition to everything else. And strangely, if you read the book, there are little moments of sort of black humor, but one of the last places that water goes uh, in the Delaware treatment plant before it goes into your tap, it's been treated this way and that way, and it's gone into this and that, and they've taken all the heavy stuff out, and then they took the light stuff out, and the last place it goes into a giant holding tank outside where pigeons are, excuse the language, but are shitting in it right and left. And how do they protect, how do they keep that from happening? They've got a little plastic owl hanging from a chain, and that's the last gasp of water treatment. <laughs> and the next place it goes from there is into your tap. So, just, just saying, you know. So, how do you tell a story about the chemicals that get into drinking water? One thing you can do is get in a canoe, you know. Uh, the body burden story tells, I go on, a, on the, in the uh, big box section, my wife and I do what I sort of think of as a natural history tour through a big box store. Uh, and then inviting the toxicologists into your house. I mean, these, these become, they're, they're self-conscious vehicles to find a narrative uh, architecture to hang the things on, uh, because the things themselves, in this case chemicals or politics or history, they don't have necessarily narrative uh, cohesion, so you've got to figure out a way to tell a story. That, that, to me, was harder than understanding the science. I finally got my head around the science. Finding my way to these narratives was actually fairly tricky. You also had some pretty interesting statistics in there, or little, little items. For example, um, you said that if you drink a glass of water in New Orleans, um, that glass of water will have been through four sewage treatment systems? Well, the way it was put to me was not right? systems, but it's been through the, a human gut five times by the time it comes to you in New Orleans. And I, I'm sure that New Orleans is no different from anywhere else. I mean, the water, not to get all philosophical or anything, but you know, water, we have the same amount of water now that we've ever had, and water just keeps on circulating. I mean, it's been a lot of other places besides the human gut, but it's been through a human gut five times by the time you drink it. So when you think about the Im imprecision of water treatment combined with the volume of chemicals that run off of highways, run off of parking lots, run out of people's pharmaceutical addiction, run off of farms, it's all going into the same system. And water treatment in big cities around the country were all built 150 years ago. And what were they intended to do? They were intended to kill things like cholera and typhus. They weren't intended to kill Viagra which you can't do anyway because Viagra is not alive, let alone, uh, you know, agricultural pesticides. If you can't kill it, water treatment doesn't really yet know what to do about it. And so you've got these municipal water treatment plant administrators wringing their hands trying to figure out what to do with all these what they call emergent contaminants. What are they going to do to clean this stuff up? It's not that easy. And, you know, we tend to think that things can always be fixed at the back end. And this is a case where you've got to fix it at the front end. You've got to somehow figure out how to keep this stuff out of the system in the first place. Yeah, when I was doing my little research uh, on Google, um, after I found the, uh, <coughs> that, that grate in the Delaware and Raritan, I went on the Elizabethtown Water site, website, um, because the water in this area is supplied by Elizabethtown Water. Um, and I wanted to learn a little bit more, so I found out that the, the canal actually is delivering water to a water intake um, uh, pumping station on, on Harrison Street. Um, that's not the only source of water in Princeton. It, also, some water is coming from the Raritan River, um, and some water is actually coming from a well, which is um, on, in the Institute Woods, um, and it's getting mixed somehow or other. Um, but then I, I found that I could look up uh, the, the results of testing of the Princeton water to see what's there. And I found out that Elizabethtown water tests for about five different compounds like nitrates and trihalines, um, byproducts of chlorine, phosphates, phosphates, and bacteria, and that's it. So of those 80,000 chemicals that you mentioned, um, not a single one of them is being tested for. So we don't actually know what's in that water. Um, I, I suppose people in environmental sciences can tell us that the tests have been done in the Princeton water. We, we have some screens, but I don't know what they are. I think, did you have a question? Yes. I just wondered how, how did they tell the story in Europe that it was heard? Well, I, I'm not a political historian, but my, my sense from the research that I've done 
is that Europe, this is going to be a sweeping generalization, but Europe has more of a public health sentiment and they have less of a, or their, their relationship with industry is not nearly uh, what it is here in the United States. So in Europe, uh, again, without oversimplifying, European, European uh, legislative bodies tend to think about public health first and industry second. And here it's the reverse in spades. So if you think, of, I mean, I'll just give you an example. I, about six months ago, uh, Maryland PERG, the Maryland Public Interest Research Group, they've got them in all, every state. Uh, they asked me to come with them down to Annapolis to start thinking about uh, what might be done to start pushing some legislation through in, in Maryland. And I was walking through the, the state capitol building with this woman who works for Maryland PERG, and she says, you want to know how, how chemical reform looks on the ground in this state and in any state? She says, uh, you're, you're a, a state legislator and you're sitting at your desk and you're now going to get lobbied by the two sides of this argument. In one door comes the Maryland Perg girl who is a 23-year-old college grad who has been running around neighborhoods with her clipboard asking for donations. Why? To pay her salary, right? Because she, she doesn't get a you know, contribution. She has no job. She doesn't go door to door. She doesn't lobby that. So on one side you've got the girl who has to, lo it has to go door to door to pay herself. And on the other side, you've got, she, and she, this woman pointed, she see that guy up on the steps, he's got about six cell phones going at once. This guy makes a million dollars a year lobbying only in the state of Maryland on behalf of big chemical, big oil, big gas. So you're the state legislator, you're sitting at your desk, and here comes a 23-year-old who's just finished lobbying for money for her salary, and in, in the other door comes the lobbyist. And you're the legislator, and where are you going to go with that? That's the way it looks on the ground. So the, and not to get all revved up about this, but this is a... This issue is really a place where uh, you know, American capitalism and American de democracy really come into contact because the only thing that trumps money is bodies. And the only way the 23-year-old can convince that legislator to vote this way, not that way, is to fill his room with lots of people. This is what the Occupy Wall Street thing is starting to show people, is that masses of people is the only thing that can trump indust industry pow political power. And just to anticipate, or, or answer a question that I uh, think about a lot. The, the biggest feeling, the biggest impression that this whole project has left me with is not one of hypochon uh, hypochondria or anxiety about this stuff. It's anger at the way the system of uh, regulation and in industry has completely broken down. Uh, and you see this in spades at the federal level, worse at the federal level, but at the state level, the pressure is constant. And in Maine, the, the, just to complete the circle. In Maine, where I did, uh, interviewed all the people in the body burden study, they, it so happened that the year that they were pushing through uh, regulation of these chemicals, the woman who was the Speaker of the House was a 30-year-old uh, woman who had just gotten married and was thinking about having kids. And she got so worked up about this because she actually was one of the volunteers in the body burden study. And she said, your, you know, Speaker of the House of your state government has 37 synthetic chemicals in her body, and I've decided I'm not going to put up with this anymore. So she helped shepherd through all this legislation, and Maine now has some of the most progressive uh, chemical legislation in the United States. Why were they able to do it in Maine? They were able to do it in Maine because Maine is poor, and Maine does not have a big industrial presence. So when industry showed up to lobby the state house, they would go up to these legislators and do, you know, reenact what I just showed you, and the legislator said, I have no constituents in my district that work for any industry because we don't have any industry. So I either have like pregnant mommies coming in the door or I have industry reps from Washington coming up and trying to represent industry that doesn't exist here. So they voted in favor of the mommies. And believe me, the mommies came out in droves. So Maine was a, in a way either a useful or an irrelevant case study because it's a, one of the rare places where there's industry has so uh, shaky a grip on the system. Maryland has a, is, is going through, they've actually scripted themselves right on the main model and they have a much harder time because there's a much stronger industrial political presence for obvious reasons down there. But yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, there are companies in Europe that are making products that go out two different doors. One door goes to the European market and the other door goes to the United States. The products that go to Europe are regulated products that come, or I should not just regulated, but are, are stripped of those ingredients. The ones that come here are not. Now again, you can see how you can get all worked up about this. Like, is that what you, is that what America want? I mean, is that the kind of marketplace you want? You're allowing this 
Because what we have is a rhetoric of, of uh, you know, freedom of industry, freedom, get, all, get the regulators off our backs so we can have, an, you know, the unlimited choice. And people are always, you know, lobbying for deregulation. Well, we already, when it, in this, this particular case, we already live in, a, in an utterly deregulated environment. And this is what we get. We get flame retardants in our breast tissue. That's what you get when you have deregulated chemical industry. And uh, Europeans have taken a very different approach. I, I don't understand why it could be in the financial interest of, a, say, a European cosmetics company to produce two different products for the two different markets. Wouldn't it actually be less expensive for them to just do one product and just regularize it for the European market and then sell it in the United States? I, I can't answer that. I don't know if it is a function of you know retooling the, the, the factory or, or, or what the reason would be. I mean, I will say that for, for those people who are hung up on regulation and, you know, uh, regulation crushing business energy or whatever you might say, the other way to think of the opposite way of thinking about it is that creating uh, regulatory impediments to toxic chemicals opens up the market to products that don't contain them. So if you think, for example, there's a very popular company called Seventh Generation out there, and, and you may have seen their products. I interviewed the guy who is their product designer in Burlington, Vermont, which is where they're based. And they, you know, they create toilet paper made without chlorine. They create laundry detergents with plant ingredients, you know, whatever it is. And their, their company is doing fabulously because there is a certain market that knows about this stuff and wants it. And you know, this is where you take the organic food model and say organic food is growing 20% a year. And now it's no longer a fringe thing. It's right in everybody's neighborhood supermarket because the market demanded it. And so then, you know, the question is, are you optimistic about the market or are you pessimistic about the market and think that it's got to be a regulatory thing? And, and I think uh, they're, you know, they're opposing points of view on that. In my, my estimation, it is like climate change and that you can drive a Prius all you want and it's not going to solve anything. What you've got to have is like serious sweeping kinds of uh, prohibitions on the production of certain kinds of things and that will allow other kinds of things to start to, you know how that is. It can't be done on a consumer basis because it'll just take too long. Can I ask the inverse of the European question? Uh, when American companies want to sell, chemical companies want to sell products to Europe, do they have to meet the European yes. standards? So American companies also have two doors. Well, I was just actually, as, you, as when you say that, I was on a business website, uh, kind of a, a industry website today, seeing what the business community was saying about this Lautenberg bill that's trying to reform this. And they are uh, worried about Americans following in the European model because they're worried what it's going to force them to do. And I'm, I regret to say that their initial take on this new law, the, the word that they use on the industry website is the law in its current state is toothless. So the, the, the chemical reform crowd is really hopeful that this legislation will do something, but the industry does not seem particularly worried about it in its current form. So, you know, I think when, you know, how, th this is less true now that Obama's around, but it used to be, you know, you'd hear Bush saying things like, what do you want us to be, like another Sweden? Right, you remember that? What do you want us to be, like another, my, have, my wife happens to be uh, of Swedish stock, and when, I remember when Bush went to Sweden, and, and uh, I don't know if you recall this, but there, were, there was a great video of these Swedish women uh, dropping their pants, and it said, Bush, go home, or something written across their... <laughs> They're buttocks. I, there's something about Sweden that really, he said he would never go back to Sweden again. And I think Sweden was probably happy with that. But when it comes to the chemical thing, Sweden is even further ahead than the rest of Europe. And in fact, if the question is, do you want us to be more like Sweden, the answer would be yes. We would like to be more like Sweden. So. Okay, can I ask a question about your, uh, your editor and your relationship with your editor? So did liability ever enter? That, or your publisher, and how did you guys negotiate that? Well, um, let me ask what you, what, what you suspect might be a problem. The, the answer is that you went through a full legal review and all that, but what, what would... Right, and I think that's where I'm going with this, is that, uh, you know, uh, any statement that's on the Yeah, I mean, I, I, will, I will say... Did you have to be more careful? Did you have to write in certain ways? To be less specific in some parts? Um, well, I, I think you probably have in the back of your mind something that I certainly did when I was writing it, which was the whole um, 
Oprah Winfrey flap about her getting on TV and saying, I will never eat another hamburger. Do you remember this, when, when this happened no, a few years ago? Well, so there was a story about, uh, it was another E. coli uh, recall of some sort, and Oprah said famously, I will never eat another hamburger, and she was sued by the meatpacking industry. That's what I remember, yes. Right, and it took Oprah's uh, financial wherewithal to defend herself in court, and it's, she, I think she spent a million dollars or something like that. Uh, well, if in my case, because I'm a journalist, uh, everything that's in the book came well, I should say most of it came from scientific studies. So if a scientific study says uh, there are phthalates in plastic drinking water bottles, you know, libel law says that if you say something that is true, you can defend yourself in court. It's, it happens to be true, right? So I'm not saying that this particular company is causing people to get cancer. What I'm saying is the science indicates that bisphenol A is found in baby bottles and it can leak from the bottle into the milk into the infant. That happens to be true. So. Uh, I mean, I'm not so much concerned about uh, a, an error of fact as I would be about, a, you know, an industry trying to muscle something out of the public consciousness. Uh, and, you know, those of you who know the story of Rachel Carson, Rachel Carson uh, had breast cancer, knew she had breast cancer as she was putting the final touches on Silent Spring. And she died, I think, 18 months after the book came out. And in the 18 months between the time the book came out and she died, uh, she won every major literary and scientific award that there was, but she also became an absolute uh, whipping post for the chemical industry. They just tried to destroy her personnel, or her, uh, her uh, reputation. And, uh, you know, that became, I mean, in a way, I suppose it, it created, it furthered her image as a martyr for the public interest somehow, because the, the, the lengths to which the industry tried to destroy her were so public and so extreme, and it turns out so factually kind of off the mark that, her, you know, that book is considered one of the great books of the 20th century, I think. So the, the short answer is yes, I was always concerned about it, and uh, I, if your question is did I ever feel any editorial pressure, no. I mean, what I did is I, I uh, you know, hewed very close to the line, like make sure everything is documented and, you know, I, I was making no scientific claims for the first time because that's, I, I'm, I'm not capable of doing that. And for, you probably could tell from my presentation, as an English and environmental humanities person, I was at least as interested in the cultural phenomenon as I was in the science. Like to me, it's more interesting to talk about the history of the lawn than the history of, of flame retardants. Because that, you know, the question is how have we come to be so saturated, so comfortable, so familiar with this stuff in every part of our life? How has that come to be? That's, that was most interesting to me. Yeah. So without having had the benefit of reading the book, and I understand being down to do so, but um, it's kind of what's the punchline? You know, I mean, there's obviously legislative issues that need to be resolved in some way, and there are things that we can, choices we can make as individuals but it seems like there's a lot of other stuff that, that kind of is the so what here, right? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just answer spontaneously with what just popped into my head. Some of you may know the, uh, the writing of a, of a famous novelist, essayist, and Kentucky farmer named Wendell Berry. He's kind of one of the great kind of avuncular figures in the environmental literature thing, whatever that is out there. And, and he, he is a, an old, uh, you know, uh, he, he writes essays about the connection and the disconnection between people and landscape. That's one of his central questions. And this book it owes a lot of its sort of attitude towards that sentiment, which is that one of the reasons that we've gotten to the place where we are is we are so, so utterly disconnected from, you name it, from our natural landscape. When we talk about our drinking water, I mean, I, probably not in this crowd, but you ask any crowd of undergraduates, uh, fundamental questions like, do you know where your water comes from? Do you know where your, the light in this room comes from? Do you know where your heat comes from? They, not one of them can answer. And if that's true, are walking across the campus, I teach at the University of Delaware, walking across the campus, uh, can you point to a body of water anywhere in sight? And there isn't one. Because every stream, I mean, that doesn't mean there wasn't any, but all the streams that might have once been there are now piped underground. So there's no water anywhere in sight. So, as it happened a couple of years ago, I was out teaching a class on the green Strangely enough, talking about Rachel Carson, when a guy drives, this is in the book, guy drives by in his little tractor for the maintenance crew, and he's got six nozzles going at once, spraying the lawn where we were sitting. 
And I said, I said, I, I did not set this up, but I asked one of my students, I said, who's going to go ask the guy what he's spraying? And she goes up and taps him on the shoulder. He's got a full body chem suit zipped up to his chin. And he says, oh, it's 2,4-D. You don't have to worry about it. And where you're sitting, we, uh, we sprayed that five hours ago, so you don't have to worry about it. And she came back and said, I said, so what do you, what's 2,4-D? She said, I don't know. I said, 2,4-D was 50% of the constituents of Agent Orange. And 2,4-D is the most ubiquitous lawn chemical that there is right now. And it's all over the place. And as soon as it rains, it's all going to run into the watershed. But she doesn't know about that because she can't see any water. Like she said, what do you mean it's going to run into a creek? There are no creeks. So do you see what I mean? So therefore, the idea that you can walk across campus and see a guy spraying your lawn, all you think is, ah, isn't, this campus takes such good care of its, of its grounds. That's all you think because you, don't, you can't think beyond that because you don't see the water. You don't know the connections of rain and, and rivers. Right? So the, if, you, if the question is, what do we make of this? I mean, how long do you have? Right? The question is, do you want me to advise you to throw away your Teflon pans? I can do that. But if you want to know, like, if you want to ask, like, what do we want to do in a deep way? It's a much longer conversation, and it really requires, for better or for worse, like a real rethinking about things in in very potentially deep and life changing ways. And I don't mean that in a you know a new agey kind of way, but in a very serious kind of way, like trying to opt out of this bombardment of things like the fact that technology will always make your life better, or new products will always make your life better, because now we're finding not just that it's creating garbage, but it's creating actual, you know, clinically provable health issues in your very body. I mean, that becomes, you know, it's, uh, it goes right to the root of a lot of things that we've become very comfortable with, I guess. So I, I can give you very short answers or very long answers, and the question is how much time do you want to spend thinking about it? And if you're like me, you're cursed with having to think about it all the time. And, uh, you know, so, go ahead. Practical question. I, I love the book, and I took most of your recommendations to heart, and I tried to implement some things. And I'd like to know how you got rid of the toxic chemicals in your basement, because I went to a toxic a hazardous waste day run by my state DEP. It was the worst experience of my life. They were throwing chemicals in open vats. The people working there, actually, when I asked how did they get all these volunteers, they were low level vendors who needed to do it for community service, which I thought was really horrible for them. And I had a, an allergic reaction that sent me to the doctor just from being in proximity to these open pits of God as well. My husband and I both had headaches and were like that for days. So here we are trying to do something right and get rid of things in our home that could affect us and we're even harder. Well, let's just think about that in, in pieces. So let's talk about the fact that you have products in your house that require you to go to a special landfill in the first place. Right now, you may think, God, that's just the way things are. We've got stuff that you can't throw into a normal landfill. Like if they're that bad for a landfill, they can't be good to have lying around your house. And you think about scaling that up. You know, it's not just your, the stuff that's under this sink, it's under the stuff that's in, under all the sinks and in the basement and in your shed and all the pesticides over there. That's just your house. And then you multiply that by every house in the block, every house in your city, and you're talking about a, a serious volume of stuff. That's number one. So then it all has to go to a place. And then you bring up this question, which I haven't even started talking about, which I have spent a lot of time writing and teaching about, is this environmental justice component, which is then you dump it in some place and you just let those people deal with it. Now, it just so happens that a couple of days ago on Friday, I brought my students on a field trip, uh, which was billed as a toxic tour of East Baltimore. Now, East Baltimore, if you haven't been there, maybe you've seen, you've been to the Johns Hopkins Health Center, one of the glowing kind of Oz's of international health. It is right in uh, the worst part, right next to one of the worst parts of Baltimore. And I was, this trip was run by a, a community activist in East Baltimore. And he drove us by all the construction sites that the Hopkins is doing, right across the street from all the Hopkins owned buildings, which are now boarded up drug houses. I know exactly where it is, like, what it Hopkins. Yeah, I don't even want to get into, I mean, I don't, thankfully Hopkins is not my employer, but they have terrible community relations because of this. Uh, then he took me to the landfill this and the toxic dump that and the, former oil refinery there over there. And this is all in the neighborhood. Like people fish down there where they refined oil for 50 years. And they play in a playground right next to this place. It was a mountain of, of glass 
that had been sharded to the point of like microscopic particles. He says every time it blows wind, uh, the kids in the neighborhood get like the, all their mucous membranes start to actually bleed because they're getting cut by these like tiny pieces of glass. This is an open like six story high mountain of glass shards right in the middle of the neighborhood. You know, and you think about what that means. I mean, when you start bringing the environmental justice, racial, socioeconomic thing into this equation, it opens up a whole nother can of worms. You can go on to EPA's website to what's called the toxic release inventory. This is kind of stuff you've been doing. And just like punch in zip codes and see where stuff is going. And you know, Princeton may be fine, but Wilmington isn't. God knows you start going to places like Houston, right, where you're starting to look at people who actually live right next to these neighborhoods that have been absolutely saturated, not with consumer products, but with the chemicals that are going into it. And it's, it's a major issue. And those people, obviously, without stating the obvious, have zero recourse. Right? They have no financial, political clout anywhere. So, you know, again, it's, this can be spun as sort of a yuppie thing, like, oh, organic food, I'll use plant-based laundry detergents. But if you open up this door and start thinking about what the implications are, it, you know, the, you can go all over the place. So how did you get rid of yours? Oh, well, I did the, what you should always do, which is put it on Craigslist. <laughs> I put, I said, free paint. And I, I try it sometime. Put free paint on Craigslist, and within like 30 minutes, I had 100 requests. And I said, I just put it out there. Said, just come on over, and it was gone. And I, you know, I did have the ethical debate. I was like, geez, now they've got Carson and Jones in their basement. I had like 50 dollars things of Roundup, almost completely full. Just I should have. Oh, that Roundup, that'll go in a heartbeat. People love Roundup. And you know, since we're at an institution, I might as well throw this out there. You know, so the University of Delaware, I'm sure like Princeton, is really doing a lot to market itself as a super environmentally hip, you know, scientifically progressive, very cutting edge. And it is. The great new facilities, lots of really great scholars. And you know, they're spraying 2,4-D on the grass. And the president's mansion has this guy running around with the full chem suit spraying everything in sight. It's like the right hand and the left hand don't know what they're doing. You know, like how do you how do you do that? How do you have recycling day and you know spraying Agent Orange on your lawn? Like I, did, I mean, maybe I'm just an English professor, but that doesn't make any sense to me. So, what but, about the uh, the issue of causality? Uh, you know, the chemical companies are going to defend themselves by saying nothing is proved, right? And so, there's a problem of causality here because none of these chemicals has really very few of them have actually been tested. So we can't link cause and effect with them. How would you recommend um, uh, we, as the public, encourage? Um, uh, companies and the government to start testing these things and how to sort through those 80,000 compounds to figure out which ones we really ought to be focusing on first. Well, I think that, that is a central question that drove the European legislation and it drives the states. And I, for my money, I think the body burden thing is the, is the perfect solution. So if you have, again, let's say scientists can prove that, you know, dousing uh, laboratory mice with uh, bisphenol A will create endocrine problems. And you can prove that anybody who's come into contact with bisphenol A has it in their bodies. Just making those two cases, I think, is a, is a to me, maybe again, I'm just an English professor, but that, that seems reasonable. Now, what if you were not just the state house leader in Maine, but what if you were uh, the president of the United States, or better yet, uh, the wife of the president of the United States, or even better, uh, the children of the president of the United States, who got up on national television and said, um, you know, my fellow Americans, we have just had body burden tests, and it turns out that the president and his wife and his children all have 75 carcinogens in their body. And we would just like to have you think about what that might mean, and now let's have a conversation about synthetic chemicals. Not that therefore we're all doomed to have breast cancer or whatever it is, but let's have a conversation. And uh, you know, not to parrot, maybe some of you have seen this movie Food Inc., which is based on Michael Pollan's work and Eric Schloss's work about food, but the question is not just about science, it's about information and the accessibility, the availability of information and the requirement that companies uh, provide information. So just like you want companies to provide nutritional information on your food, it seems reasonable to have them provide information about other things. And if you just simply had a conversation about it, I think you'd go, you know, 70% of the way there to actually having some enlightened or reasonable talk about this, which I think is the main thing that's lacking. Is it, nobody, this has not even occurred to people. And at least having the conversation would go a long way to having people think about it. We have time for one more question. Uh, 
I was just interested in pursuing the question of change. <clears throat> I mean, how do you ever affect change? You know, the one or two percent of us who read your book, or I haven't read your book, I haven't seen yet, but, uh, you know, who are knowledgeable, will do things in their own homes to remove some of the time, but you're still exposed to lots of things that you have no control over. The legislators at the national and the kind of state level are not doing they're in the pocket of a big industry. Um, so I mean, is, is it really just going to take long-term, um, um, you know, emphasis on changing public opinion? Is that, I mean, you know, folks like yours and other pieces of information come out and eventually be enough public opinion? I mean, is that going to happen? Do you foresee any of that? Or I don't know. I, I, I can tell you that uh, this book has been a very hard book for Random House to market because they have found, uh, you know, again, is this, is this topic more like climate change or is it more like food? They were hoping it was going to be more like food because everybody wants to read about food. Unfortunately, it turns out to be more like climate change, which is people think, God, how terrifying. Do I not want to know any more about that? because it's outside of my control. And this goes back to your question about editorial influence. The, the thing that my editors beat me over the head with is this book has to provide practical solutions to people. You can't just write about this abstractly. These people are going to freak out and they want to know what to do about it. And I said, I'm not going to write a women's magazine article about this. I'm not going to say, write a book that says, here are the 10 tips to, beauty, you know, to beautifying yourself in a green. I don't want to do that. I'm not interested in that. Uh, I also said, they also were absolutely uh, determined that this not be an environmental book. They said this has to be a health book. And I said, I know you all live in New York and there's no environment in New York, but you've got to take it from me. The rest of the world lives in a place where the health and, the, and environment are actually like, you know, interconnected. But I think it's a really difficult question. And it's, uh, the question about what, what's going to make change happen, I, I don't have a good answer for. I, I will say that this Occupy Wall Street in all its imperfections, uh, and all its craziness does give me some sense that maybe there's something that's possible, like there are actually groundswell things that might kind of, kind of click a little bit. Because what, the, what that is, again, in its imperfection, is at least raising questions about corporate, uh, what do you say, secrecy, corporate access, corporate control, whatever it is. And that is what this book yeah. mostly is about. So, I don't know, if you may have seen this, the piece in the Sunday Times, it's, there's a story about these Catholic nuns that have decided they're going to go to these, uh, you know, they're going to buy X number of shares in the company and go to the shareholders meetings and raise bloody hell about corporate responsibility. And the, even the guys in the article said, you know, these, these nuns are really cute, but the truth is, we're never going to change. Basically, we're never going to change. We'll throw them a few bones and say we're going to, but they, there was no evidence that they were going to do anything about it. So, you know, if maybe we can move past corporate nuns as you know, social or political lobbies to the rest of us, then maybe something will get going. But how this gets any traction is, is really a mystery to me. I don't know. Well, I, I, I will say teaching about it is the best thing I, I know how to do. Uh, what about the, you mentioned earlier, the possibility of doing nothing rather than doing something. I mean, there are a lot of ways in which you can do nothing and get a nice result. And in our place in Hopewell, we stopped putting any chemicals on our, we have a, a kind of a lawn below our house. We just stopped doing anything about it. We also stopped mowing it. And I mow this thing once a season, late in the season. And it started out as, as a plant at one of those sprayed lawns, you know, where they, they just spray it off a truck and there's this green sludge that goes down and then one species of grass comes up. It was 10 years ago. And now it's this amazing area of biodiversity. Um, and we have milkweed coming up. Um, milkweed attracts all kinds of insects, including monarch butterflies. You go out there in the summertime, and we have monarchs flying, floating around in the air. And then, if I, you know, you can go out there, and you you see um, you see all kinds of other insect species just profusely all over the place, which of course attracts migratory birds. So we get migrating <coughs> songbirds, and then we've got a food pyramid over this yard now, um, because the birds attract top predators like the sharp-shinned hawk. And so we now see these hawks that will bomb through and just, you know, take a dove. Um, and it's like having a little piece of the Serengeti right in your kitchen <laughs> window. Um, and it's all as a result of not doing anything, uh, not even mowing. Um, and it also saves money. Right, but you're now presuming, you are now uh, embodying somebody who is not freaked out by insects. 
So just to you know, throw out another one of these cool. kind of generic comments, like what is your relation, what is our relationship with insects? Like we've lived for 50 years where we think that getting rid of all insects is the best possible thing we can do. This is what Doug Townley's book is all about. Like you can't rebuild bird populations until you rebuild insect populations. He talks about something which I remember, driving around in the 1970s and you know, you go on a three hour car ride and your windshield is like, uh, in, you know, you can't see through it because it's got so many insects blasted on the windshield. That never happens anymore, right? The insect populations have crashed. And you know, this, only, this comes up in the popular imagination with things like bee colony collapse and things like that. But we're talking about insects more generally. So what's our relationship with bugs? You say, bring them in. It build, rebuilds the whole food chain. Well, that's true, but try telling that to the, you know, the McMansion crowd. They don't want bugs. They think bugs are the enemy. Oh, what they're missing. <laughs> So we're talking about deep, systemic things, unfortunately. Well, now that we've finished with bugs and toxins, we'd like to invite you to our reception. <laughs> Upstairs, is that correct? So uh, first of all, uh, please join me in thanking uh, about the book, but, and we do have a reception upstairs, everyone is welcome to come. Um, if you've got more questions or more solutions, please come on upstairs and talk some more. Right, thank you very much.